vibrant discussion online to go along with the discussion we're having in the auditorium. So in recent years, mobile technology has expanded dramatically around the world. According to a Cisco Visual Networking Index, a global mobile data traffic has doubled for the fourth consecutive year. And by the end of 2016, it is estimated that 10 billion mobile devices are projected to be in use around the world. We are seeing many global threats due to natural disasters, terrorist activities, uh, criminal actions, uh, and other types of things. And mobile devices, such as smartphones and tablets, have enabled emergency providers and the general public to learn how to manage some of these challenges. In conjunction with today's event, we are releasing a new paper entitled How Mobile Devices Are Transforming Disaster Relief and Public Safety. Uh, this is a paper co-authored with Liz Valentini. Copies of the paper are out in the hallway or are available online at brookings.edu. And the paper looks at how mobile devices assist with public safety, disaster planning, as well as a crisis response. In particular, it looks at the, the ways in which mobile devices have helped save lives and ameliorated human suffering around the world. It provides a new means for quick and effective communications during times of natural disaster. And this event is part of our mobile economy project and we appreciate the generous financial support provided by Qualcomm for our work in this area. And this is a three-year project that looks at how mobile technology affects a variety of areas, including uh, education, healthcare, public safety, and entrepreneurship. Today, we have a number of distinguished guests to help us understand this topic. Richard Price is the president of Pulse Point Foundation, which is a nonprofit uh, organization established to guide enhance and expand the reach of the Pulse Point uh, CPR uh, uh, AED notification uh, app. He retired as the fire chief for San Roman Valley Fire Protection District uh, at the end of uh, 2012 after a distinguished 33-year uh, uh, service in uh, the fire department. Uh, chief Price has a strong technical background and is well known for using technology to shape management processes and encourage uh, civic engagement. Susie DeFrancis is the Chief Public Affairs Officer for the American Red Cross. In this role, she oversees all of the enterprise-wide communications, government relations, and strategic partnerships to advance the mission of the American Red Cross. Previously, she served as Assistant Secretary for Public Affairs at the U.S. Department of Health and Human Services, and prior to that, she served in the White House as Deputy Assistant to the President for Communications. Admiral James Barnett is co-chair of Venable's Telecommunications Group and a partner in the firm's cybersecurity practice. He has over 30 years of, of service in the U.S. Navy and the Navy Reserve. He served as the Chief of uh, Public Safety and the Homeland Security uh, Bureau of the FCC, where he uh, worked on cybersecurity initiatives. Uh, Christina Anderson is a co-founder and chief evangelist of LifeSafe, which is a leading mobile application for sharing and reporting public safety information. She's become an advocate for improving campus safety and violence prevention since becoming one of the most critically injured survivors of the Virginia Tech uh, shooting tragedy, which is one of the worst uh, school shootings uh, committed uh, by a single person in the United States. In 2007, she was shot uh, three times while attending a French class. And so uh, since then, she has started uh, LifeSafe, and it has the mission of increasing awareness and improving overall community safety through technology and individual empowerment. To my immediate left, we have an empty seat, which we're saving for Anita Stewart, who currently is experiencing a flight delay. Uh, we're hoping that her uh, flight uh, is able to take off and uh, she is able uh, to uh, join us. Uh, she is the Senior Vice President of Strategic Partnerships for Sesame uh, Workshop. 
Uh, she joined the workshop in 2003, and she's responsible for developing uh, the strategic alliances for the workshop's uh, signature children's uh, series, uh, Sesame Street and the Electric uh, Company. So I'm going to start with uh, Susie. So at the uh, Red Cross, uh, you are using uh, mobile technology and social media in regard to disaster response. So uh, what are you uh, seeing in terms of how these technologies are helping you uh, manage uh, where people are finding needs and where damage is occurring. Well, thank you, Daryl, and thank you to the Brookings Institution and the Center for, for hosting this and for all of you for being here. Well, the American Red Cross has jumped in <laughs> big time into the whole social media, new technology area. And um, we were going that, and you may wonder, well, what's a 130-year-old institution like the American Red Cross doing in the new world of mobile technology? But we are seeing it literally revolutionize disaster response. And um, we feel it's very important that we be um, engaged and listening to social media and using all the new technology as a way to involve more people in our mission and also to serve the people that uh, we're trying to help. So we first saw um, the power of social media during the earthquake in Haiti um, in January of, of, of 2010, and what was very heartbreaking about it is that people were actually tweeting or using some form of text or something underneath the rubble, um, asking to be, you know, help, to be found. Or they might be tweeting a relative here in the United States, and the, and the relative would go, they knew we were on Twitter at the Red Cross, and they would um, send us the tweet saying, can you help? And at that point, um, we just were not prepared to handle these kind of requests. We had to take them manually and you know, get them a hold of somebody at the State Department who could then get a hold of the uh, response there in Haiti. There was no real 911 in Haiti to get to. And so um, we were just overwhelmed by the power of what was happening here and decided that we had to get involved in this in a big way, that this was the way people were starting to communicate. And if they're going to communicate that way on a daily basis, they're going to communicate that way in a crisis. So we actually had a summit in um, August of 2010 where we brought together a lot of our partners like FEMA and others. Um, and of course, of course, the technology companies, Google, Facebook, Twitter, all get together to talk about this um, phenomenon of emergency social data. And what do we do with it when there's a crisis? And uh, this led to a, a, a report that we produced, which is, is on our website, which you can find. But it also got us thinking about how do we operationalize social media? How do we really get ourselves in a position where we can analyze tens of thousands, even hundreds of thousands of social data and figure out a way to use that in our operations? And with the help of a great partner, Dell, uh, who had built for them Dell a social media center in order to follow their customers and what their customers needs were. Dell um, came and to the American Red Cross here in Washington DC at our national disaster headquarters and built for us um, the first digital operations center, the first social media center if you will that's dedicated solely to humanitarian relief. Uh, they gave us the hardware, the software, the the expertise to do this. So I invite any of you to come visit our Digital Operations Center, um, which is right over here at 20, 20 E Street. And what you'll see when you get in there is um, a way to visualize what's happening on social media during a disaster and what is it telling us. We have four screens that you'll be able to see. One is our heat map. Um, that is a geographic map of the, of the world as well as of our country. And you can see instantly when a disaster is bearing down on a certain community, the amount of social data that's all of a sudden being produced by people who are, you know, tweeting, hey, tornado's coming, take, take cover, you know, did you know that this was happening? And you can literally see a state like Texas go red when a tornado a year ago went into the Arlington area of Dallas. Um, so we get a sense right away. We used to go to CNN to find that. Now we can see it right on the map as people begin to talk about what's happening. Um, the second screen you'll see is we can tell what they're talking about. Uh, are they looking for uh, first aid tips, preparedness tips? Do they need food? Do they need water? Do they need shelter? And we can see those needs arising and we can categorize them and get them to the proper operations people who can look into it. 
Um, we can see who are the prominent uh, people out there on social media. As many of you may know, in a disaster, people spring up almost organically from the community and begin to organize, you know, hey, somebody needs diapers over here, can somebody get them this? And we begin to follow these people because they're becoming part of the response too. And finally, we can see um, in another screen kind of what's the sentiment and, and, and how are people feeling about what's going on? Are they getting help? Are they not getting help? And then we can adjust our operations. So we've been using this tool since 2012, but during the hurricane in Sandy, we really saw the power of it. As you all remember, Sandy was an enormous um, uh, destruction throughout the, the East Coast and into New Jersey and New York specifically. During that time, we were able to analyze 2.5 million pieces of social data that was occurring during that time we were able to tag about 10,000 posts. It could be anything from tagging it as situational awareness. This is telling us something about what's going on the ground. Or it could be need for food, need for water. We were able to respond personally from our you know, digital operations center to 2,500 of those posts. And we were able to take action on 300 of them. In other words, we could tell that gee, they had a need at this particular area of the, of the, of the response that we weren't getting to. So for instance, um, people got on Facebook in Sarah Vero, New Jersey. They said, we've been here five days, we've not seen the Red Cross. Well, we wouldn't have known that without social media. So we were able to immediately get that information to our operations people and get some service delivery going in an area that needed it. People were helping us tweet out where our food trucks were. So they'd say, what can we do to help? We'd say, well, we're sending a truck to 99th and 101st on Howard Beach, and we're serving Salisbury steak today. Would you tweet that out so people know where it is? And, and all of a sudden, people were really getting involved in our response. Now, how did we scale up at a time like this? Because we usually get maybe four or 5,000 tweets a day about Red Cross. But it, during this period, we were getting tens of thousands, even hundreds. We have digital volunteers that we have trained, and they can work remotely. They don't have to be in our digital operations center. We had one guy from the German Red Cross working out of Germany. And we empower them to respond to these people for us. We give them the information they need to have to be able to tell people where the shelters are, where they can get help. And so we, we're really involving a whole nother level of, of volunteers at the American Red Cross, and they're digital volunteers. Now, none of this can replace the volunteers we have to have on the ground to actually deliver the 17 million meals and snacks than we did during Sandy. But we are seeing online become a tremendous part of disaster response. And the only other thing I wanted to mention was that we're also seeing mobile apps playing a huge role in getting people information they need in an emergency. I was telling someone we used to um, put all the information you'd need to know in an earthquake on something like this. Well, when you're in the middle of an earthquake, you're probably not pulling this out or reading it. <laughs> so we have we've found through mobile apps that you can have something just in the palm of somebody's hand. We have an earthquake app. You can pop on it. It'll tell you one, two, three. Here's what you have to do. And before, during, and after. And um, we've got first aid on there. We've got um, a hurricane app, a wildfire app, all these apps. And we're hearing from people now that they're literally helping them to save lives in an instant, right in the palm of their hands. So it's just amazing to us how mobile technology is um, really not only um, improving disaster response, getting more people involved in the response, but it's literally saving lives. Thank you. So, Richard, you have been a fire chief, and now you have a foundation, uh, Pulse Point, that has a new app uh, on uh, CPR. And he was mentioning uh, earlier only 25% of people actually know CPR. I hope I have that uh, number right, uh, which is kind of low given the years of, uh, that we've been trying to teach people uh, that. So can you tell us about your app and the role that it plays in Thank emergency you, response? Thank you, Susie's so good. She's such a hard act to follow. You know? <laughs> a Salisbury steak hashtag probably on that. <laughs> probably a first. Uh, my story begins um, uh, in a deli as a fire chief, uh, hearing a siren in the distance, wondering where that crew was going, uh, seeing them kind of pass in front of uh, the road where the deli was and pull into the parking lot. 
and, and to my surprise, pull up right in front of that deli where I was eating with the lights and siren. Uh, as a fire chief in town, being surprised by an ambulance from your own agency uh, is, is not good. You know, if that had been a fire or something, I would have got a phone call, but I'm sitting in that, that deli in uniform, essentially on duty, uh, not plugged into medical calls that are happening up and down, you know, the district all day long, not listening to the radio like a fire crew would be. But right next door, somebody had had a cardiac arrest, was lying there unconscious, uh, just on the other side of the wall or where I was sitting. I, mean, I obviously know CPR, as a fire chief, have an AED, a public, uh, I mean, a defibrillator in my car, and likely could have made a big difference uh, in that outcome uh, if I just would have known. I'm so close. That was sort of the genesis of our idea. The ability to crowdsource Good Samaritans, CPR trained citizens, uh, at the exact time that they were needed. You know, uh, that, that statistic is uh, only 25% of the time when paramedics arrive on scene is CPR in progress. You know, only one out of four times. And we've been teaching CPR in the United States for more than 50 years. And AEDs, the public access defibrillator, is the one that you see in public spaces like this and uh, the airports and things. Those are only retrieved one, two, three percent of the time uh, by bystanders. People simply don't think about them and, and uh, don't know where to find them. So what our application allows a community to do is to notify CPR trained citizens who are nearby simultaneously with the dispatch of the community resources. So if somebody calls 911, reports somebody unconscious, unresponsive, likely needing CPR, traditional uh, resources are dispatched, and then our software running in the center will look, are there any CPR trained citizens that are essentially within walking distance, maybe a quarter mile, like a running track distance around that uh, reported location. And we notify those people. They get a push notification that says CPR is needed, the name of the location where they're at, the common place name, the business name, and the address. And then we give them a map. We show them where they are, where that patient's reported to be, and we show them where the nearby public access defibrillators are. So they can begin CPR and retrieve an AED while the crews are still en route. Now that seems like um, uh, you know, a revolutionary concept, but we have that concept today around fire extinguishers and fires. If there's a fire in this building and in this room, we're in the best position to extinguish that fire, to grab a fire extinguisher and to extinguish that fire while it's small, while it's in its early stages, in the first few minutes. We're in a far better position to change the outcome than the fire department is that's five miles away. You know, by the time they get here, that fire is larger, the room's involved, and if they take too long to arrive, then the whole building is at risk. With cardiac arrest, minutes really matter. If somebody has cardiac arrest and their heart stops, they only have about 10 minutes to survive, and brain damage starts to begin earlier than that. So getting CPR started faster within the first few minutes and getting an AED deployed in the first few minutes uh, can save hundreds of people every day. A thousand people a day die from cardiac arrest in the United States. So annually, it's more than a million people uh, worldwide. So this is a significant problem, but we can make a major difference with an application like this. We train people in CPR, we place the AEDs out there, but it requires a lot of fate. People have to be in the exact right place at the exact right time to make a difference. There has to be a witness to rest. Uh, what the application does is it kind of redefines what it means to be a witness to rest. You only have to be nearby now, not at the exact right place at the exact right time. So the odds are much greater. If you think about a community that has 10 or 20 fire stations, uh, in those kind of communities, we have thousands of CPR trained citizens uh, that are carrying the app and are, are the, the army for uh, CPR uh, in that community. So we alert the, that one fire station but we alert four, five, six, seven CPR trained citizens that are in the immediate vicinity uh, to begin. And our statistics are very good. We're seeing um, our citizens respond. We're seeing them begin CPR. We're seeing them uh, source the AEDs. Uh, we had an incident uh, recently where an off-duty nurse was notified and responded. Uh, a large percentage of our users are actually off-duty professionals. Uh, we had another incident where we had eight people respond so when our crews arrived on scene, 
the paramedics arrived on scene, they had people doing CPR, rotating into assistant CPR. CPR is very physically demanding, so having more than one person uh, makes a big difference. Uh, and people actually clapping to 100 beats a minute, mm -hmm. encouraging the other rescuers. So it's a very different scene uh, to come on to compared to you know one out of four times, to have actually eight people there. And people have more courage when they're with other people. You know, if you respond, CPR takes a lot of courage, a lot of bravery, but when you have you know, six, seven people with you, all there for the same reason, um, it's easier and the outcome's much better. Thank you, Daryl. Okay, okay. Uh, Jamie, so both uh, Susie and Richard have talked about the importance of communications. Uh, you work on public safety communication, so what is the state of safety communications today? Uh, Daryl, thanks, it's a, it's a great question. I'll be glad to talk about that. I, I would say Susie talked about Salisbury steak and, and uh, the chief had uh, a deli. I don't have a food reference to start off with. I apologize, I'll buy people a, a, a scone or something later on. But um, uh, so, so as Daryl told you, I was uh, the chief of the Public Safety and Homeland Security Bureau at the Federal, Federal Communications Commission. While I was there, I came to think of uh, public safety communications as a triangle. And I'll tell you the, the three things, the three sides of that triangle, but all of that, all the stuff that we've been talking about is occurring during a tremendous technology transition. And that transition is from the way that we communicated before, which is primarily, uh, even our wireless calls were circuit switched, uh, the, basically the old police and fire communications, and most of our, our other things were legacy communications of copper wire. And, and that's going to be around for a while, but there's a transition that's going on that we need to understand with regard to public safety communications. And that transition needs to occur in a, an open, transparent, and inclusive uh, manner. And uh, the legacy communications will be around for a long time, uh, I think, and uh, the, the DOD has, has said that they're interested in that, but it does need to be an inclusive and open discussion. So the three legs, three sides of the triangle are, the first one is, the government's ability to inform you that you're in danger so you can do something about it. And that's the public alerting side of it. Uh, and there's several developments on that, uh, that that have occurred. The, the second side, I would say, is your ability to tell the government that you've got a problem so you can get help. So that's the 911 side of it. And then the third leg of it is, in essence, public safety's ability to communicate with each other to coordinate that help or the disaster relief. And there's some major developments uh, on that side of it. Uh, I, I would say uh, some of the most incredible ones in the last 60 or 70 years. I've added to that, uh, that triangle in, in the past uh, few months and, and, and really a couple of years, uh, a third one, and it really goes to what the, the other panelists are talking about here, and that's the ability for you to tell someone else that they're in danger or them to tell you how to get help. So the whole social media side of it and yet there is an aspect of where that information needs to be incorporated in uh, overall disaster relief in the way that Susie was talking about, or whether it's our, our brethren at FEMA or whoever is managing the incident to be able to see what's happening along those lines. So first, along the, on the alerting side, some of the things that develop, and I, I don't know if uh, maybe, maybe some, if, you've, if you've got any type of smartphone, you probably have reserved some, uh, received some type of alert that there's flash flooding in a particular area or there's a, a, you know, some type of thunderstorm, severe sun, thunderstorm, or maybe even a tornado, derecho, something like that. And that all it comes from something called the commercial mobile uh, alert system, or, or the commercial groups are calling it wireless emergency alerts. This is actually a complex technology that knows where you are based on the fact that you're communicating with the cell towers all along. And if the local authorities think that there's a problem with that, they can actually pump it out to you just in that area. It doesn't matter where you live. If you are visiting here from New York, uh, you'll get that alert in that, in that area. So th th that is a major step forward, and those are going to continue in the, um, uh, in the near future. Part of it is teaching the local authorities how, how to use that best. Second leg I mentioned was the 911. 911, the first 911 call was made in Haleyville, Alabama in, in 1968. Uh, it, this is a total circuit switched uh, type of technology, and when wireless phones came along, Basically what happened is there was technology bolted on that to make it work. Because when you picked up the old Ma Bell telephone, the, the telephone company knew you exactly where you were because they, that's where they sent your bill. Uh, once you had a wireless phone, you could be anywhere. 
Uh, and so it was amazing technology to be able to find out not only where you are, but where the closest 911 center was to be able to get help to you so they could dispatch help to you. Uh, location accuracy becomes a very important uh, aspect of that to make sure that, that people know where you are. And it's been a, uh, an increasing problem, particularly because we find out is it, outdoor location accuracy is fairly easy. GPS is pretty good. Um, there are various technologies that can be used. Once you go indoors, particularly in big buildings, particularly in tall buildings, that becomes a little bit more of a problem. So if you arrive at the Empire State Building and they said, okay, they're somewhere there, good luck finding them. Uh, maybe they can't tell you because they've had a stroke. Uh, there may be some other reason why they can't communicate with you. Location actually becomes pretty important. So the FCC needs to move forward then with figuring out the technologies for indoor location accuracy. Uh, and these are some of the, the things that I think you'll see coming along. The other 911 functions, very recently the FCC adopted a 911 uh, texting type thing. Uh, unfortunately, at, at Virginia Tech, we saw students who were uh, trying to be quiet, uh, trying to get help, texting to 911. And at that time, those texts went nowhere. Now we're on the road to making sure that uh, those can be received and handled by the, uh, by the 911 call centers. The problem, of course, there's still the latency with SMS text technology, and so there's some problems with that. We need to move on beyond SMS text to, in essence, uh, next generation 911, which is truly a packet switched ability to receive all sorts. So you can take a picture of a fleeing criminal and, and that can Im immediately go out to uh, all of the, the law enforcement in the area and they can immediately pick that person up. There's so many things that we'll get from that. And then on public safety communications, uh, from 911, uh, from, excuse me, 911 to the 911 disaster, we saw tremendous problems with interoperability. Uh, public safety agencies not being able to talk to each other. We find this in disaster all the time. And the promise of the new public safety broadband network, which is known as FirstNet, is that because it's you know, a new technology, it's 4G LTE that's going to be launched across the nation, it's being launched right now, we might be able to achieve the interoperability that we have missed for the last 60 or 70 years with regular police, fire, and emergency medical um, uh, uh, communications. The trick is making sure that FirstNet gets it right. And we have a great board that's working on that right now to make sure that it is. And one of the things I would tell them is they need to remember the triangle, that, that, that public safety to public safety communications is very important, but also they need to incorporate the alerting and the 911 into that. They also need to remember that sometimes, like in Sandy, net, networks go down. And in, in that sense, the, the great spectrum that we have for public safety communications need to be augmented by satellite uh, backup, which is not going to be weather uh, dependent and can, can move forward uh, in any situation. That includes uh, satellite alerting, which can be very important. Uh, and, and the other things uh, with regard to uh, public safety communications, I think, will be improvement. And then all public safety agencies, FEMA, all of us, uh, Craig Fugate has been a great uh, advocate of making sure that social media is incorporated into our response to disasters and in any type of public safety incident, he would call this not just a, a communications device, he calls it a sensor. And it's for the exact reason that Susie was talking, you can tell what's going on from them by what people are saying. This is the, the envir exciting environment that we're in, but we need to be able to make sure, we've got the technology now, now we need to make sure that the humans using it understand it. Okay, uh, Christina, so you were shot at Virginia Tech, you now work to improve campus safety, so could you talk about your experiences and also the organization that you have formed? Sure, thank you so much Dale for having me. You blew the cover of announcing <laughs> what, why I was here. Um, at LiveSafe, we are basically changing the paradigm of campus safety. And, you know, campus safety has been a very important topic, uh, you know, in our mindset, I think probably since Columbine, obviously. But really with Virginia Tech, um, it highlighted, I think, in a really dynamic sense, the importance of receiving and sending information in real time. And just to share a little bit about my experience from that day. So I was a sophomore at Virginia Tech. Um, the shooting happened April 16th, 2007. So six years ago, I was sitting in a French classroom, and we had no prior knowledge that a previous shooting had occurred that morning, but uh, North Hall, it's an L-shaped building. It's very small. It's almost like a little bit of a mansion. We're sitting in class, and we hear very loud noises, like down the hallway, and I'm sitting on the hallway, so I kind of feel the intensity, 
And we hear it sounds, and people said they thought it was construction, all these things, but personally, I knew that it was too loud to really be anything. It, it was alarming. Our teacher went to the door, she peered outside, and she immediately shut the door and she said, call 911. And the second that she had kind of tried to slam the door, he walked in. And I went to middle school in California where we had you know, uh, unannounced tornado drills. So my response and my training went back to get on the floor and cover your head. So we had like the L-shaped desks that you slide into. I got on the floor, I put my knees under that chair, stomach on the seat, and just kind of covered hands with my head, waiting you know, what to happen. And for the first few minutes, I really thought it was an experiment, um, a prank, maybe you know, Oprah was gonna jump in. And very quickly, I think, based on the sounds and the noise I was hearing, I could tell that something very serious was happening. I looked left as he walked in, and I saw just the top of him. He was wearing a hat, and he looked very you know, determined. And I went back, and I just covered my face the entire time. Um, he didn't say anything. He didn't stop. He just literally sh shot down the rows of people. And it got closer and closer and, and faster and faster. And I remember telling myself, like, prepare yourself. Your turn is going to come. Um, and the first time he shot me was in the back, and he left. And in that time, we start hearing, you know, a little bit of cell phones ringing. You know, people are trying to, you know, murmur and move. But really, we're still kind of in lockdown mode. He came back. Um, he came back to our classroom two more times. So all in all, um, three times. And he shot himself in front of our classroom right as the police broke in. So I was shot three times, twice in the back and once in the toe. And um, as we joked earlier, you can't tell now <laughs> unless I'm in a bikini. Um, but we try to cover that. Um, when the police broke in, uh, there were a couple of things that were you know, going on. A, no one had known about the event previously had happened, the first shooting on campus. Second of all, people were trying to dial out within Norris Hall, and you know, those communications were going out. As the police were trying to enter, they also had no idea who the shooter was, where he was, what kind of students were being injured. There was no communication and no really situational awareness, essentially, for them to know how to respond. And so it took a lot of time to really sweep the building and you know, create a more efficient response. And I went back to Virginia Tech. I graduated um, in 2009. And what's interesting is these events kept happening. I thought after Tech there'd be no other school shootings, essentially. But we had you know, Helsinki, Northern Illinois, even um, the Boston bombing touched MIT's campus. And I really started thinking about how can we best impact campus safety. And so my co-founder and I became very interested with um, bystander intervention, essentially. He was working on a previous application that was one way, sending tips to police um, in DC. And I learned through a study that it was done before Virginia Tech. In two-thirds of school shootings, two, sometimes three people know about the shooting before it happens. And that, to me, was very interesting. It showed that these things are not random events. No one wakes up, when, wakes up one day and decides to commit a school shooting. People know about it, and there's leakage. How do we empower those people to speak up? Because usually, they're their peers, they're their colleagues, and they may be you know, fearful of going to adults if they're going to be in trouble or what their re repercussions are. I think we as individuals are not always empowered to call 911. We don't know what the right time is. Um, is it your responsibility? So with Live Safe, um, what we, when we focused on a college campus, we learned, you know, 91% of adults in the U.S. own a mobile, mobile phone. About 60% of those are smartphones. On a college campus, I think it's probably even higher. So we, you know, instantly, mobile technology was a very natural way of, of reaching students. And so with our app, with LiveSafe, you can submit information directly to law enforcement. And so through the app, you can submit a tip or a report, whatever you feel it you know, needs to be communicated. And with that, you can add multimedia. So you can add a, a picture, a video, um, or as well as SMS. If you want, you can do it anonymously, which is very important to kind of remove that risk of, of sharing information. Police get it on a dashboard. They have their own um, web-based dashboard that they receive with your user information, you know, your, um, your name, your contacts, emergency notifications, and your location. So student engagement and GPS tracking are our main focuses coming out of Virginia Tech on how to improve campus safety, um, two things that you know, haven't been fully, I think, amplified. So the, the purpose of it really is our goal is to be preventative. It's to create this platform where people feel inspired and empowered to share information, to really give law enforcement just more information. They shouldn't be the ones out there you know, looking for it. They should be the ones to respond, whereas really the people on the ground, you have the best information. How can we give it to you in a better way? Um, and in terms of emergencies, actual you know, times of response, what we're doing is we're giving students the option to call campus police, which often they don't know the right number to do so. So we call them campus police or 911. What happens instantly is it um, initiates distress, distress monitoring. So on the dashboard, they see where you are. You pop up as a blue light. And even if you can't communicate, 
Um, say you are actually trapped in someone's car or you're being taken away, you can't respond. They are watching you where you, know, where you are and it's not turned off until they've located you, um, which is a really, really important feature, I think, just for you know, accountability purpose. We're also enabling a social safety map. So now there's a new place for conversations for around campus safety issues. If there's, um, campuses have to file um, through Clery a data log of all the events that have happened. We're putting that on the map directly to give users a more just awareness of what's happening around them. Parents like that, students like that, um, and law enforcement likes the interaction with students and <coughs> communities as well. And also alert emergency contacts. Um, like we said with Virginia Tech, being able to, um, you know, I, my phone at the time was not a smartphone. I could not call my parents, but a lot of people did try to text, and SMS will go through where over Wi-Fi, whereas calling won't. So giving people extra ways to, um, to communicate and just you know, touch in and, and touch base with, um, with their loved ones. So right now, we have been beta testing in over 20 colleges and universities, and we've received just really great feedback from schools and police chiefs. Um, but really, I would encourage your feedback and your, you know, your advice on, on the app, because I think what will really make it um, take it to the next level is it needs to be user friendly and user engaged. Um, our goal at the end is really to make this the empowerment platform where we have 30,000 students and 30,000 know, community members speaking up and feeling they own their own safety and they can easily reach law enforcement to really, like I said, prevent these things before they happen versus focusing on just how do we respond to situations as well. So we've heard lots of innovative examples of the use of mobile technology in natural disasters and uh, public safety. But then Jamie was also mentioning the problem of interoperability in the uh, current system. So a question I'd like to throw out to each of you on the panel, and you can jump in in whatever order that you would like. What do you see the role of business and the role of government in dealing with these uh, interoperability uh, questions? I mean, we have next generation 911, there's the public safety uh, first net uh, that's being uh, developed. Some people are talking about the importance of satellite backups, uh, uh, cell tower backups, there's uh, LTE direct and small cell technologies. What should government and business be focusing on? Anybody who wants to jump in? And don't be shy. Well, I think FirstNet is uh, you know, a, a fantastic initiative. They have a lot of challenges ahead, but to have a public safety broadband network with high reliability and uh, parallel capabilities and hardened infrastructure uh, and a known user base, so it makes it uh, much easier to, uh, to pu push secure information and do some things that are hard to do on the public networks or in the public app store. So I think FirstNet, if, um, if it can be successful, will be critical in uh, much of the challenges we have ahead in public safety. Darrell, one of the transition issues is, is that uh, Americans have come uh, very much to expect that when they pick up a phone or, or, or try to get a dial tone, they're going to get it and their call is going to go through. You know, we realize that cell phones drop uh, connection sometime, but uh, by and large, we have an extremely reliable communication system. One of the things that we have to think about is, is that uh, in the background of all this, as we move from circuit switch to, to packet switched, is the reliability of our um, our, our infrastructure, our communication infrastructure, is, is not necessarily the same as it has been. The FCC monitors the reliability of our legacy communications. Not many people realize that they don't necessarily have the authority to do so for our, uh, our, our new and, and emerging uh, technology. So it's one of the things we have to do, and, and it goes to FirstNet as well, uh, because that is a, it's going to be a packet-switched IP-based uh, system. and so. There's going to be this, this tension between the fact that the, uh, the network is actually underfunded, even though there's somewhere between 2 and $7 billion that's been appropriated. To cover the country, it's not going to have as, as much uh, as, it, as it needs. And so there may be a tendency to say, well, maybe we don't need to harden it quite so much, and, and there'll be that tension. But the main thing is that, and to go to your question directly, is there's got to be this partnership. I think that's where it is. Government's got to create the environment for these new technologies to be able to be used to ensure the, the safety of the public or to allow the public to ensure its own safety. Uh, and then we need to be able to allow an innovative companies to be able to do it. So, I mean, there, there's so many out there that need to be discovered and found. I mean, there's one, you know, when you have all of the uh, uh, infrastructure that is flattened like it was in Sandy or Katrina, 
uh, the ability to go in with mobile ad hoc mesh networks. So you're actually, you're not dependent on, uh, on the, the, the electrical grid necessarily. You're not dependent on being able to tie back in. You can have the, the system there. It can go, in essence, it's leaping from machine to machine to machine to create the network. And then maybe at some point you can get back into the back hall to be able to communicate with other folks. Those are the types of things we need to be able to encourage, the, the satellite alerting, all these types of things. Uh, and so if government can create that kind of environment where these can be incorpor incorporated, I think you'll see some great public-private partnerships. Yeah, and I think that goes to uh, government as a platform where, you know, things like the GPS network, the FirstNet network, uh, where innovation can build on top of it, but there's no way to invest at the level that's required without government support. Okay, Susie and then Christine. Well, I just would echo what you said about uh, text 911. I definitely think that is one thing that should be done. We identified that after Haiti and thought that that was, you know, something that the government should certainly be involved in. And what we're trying to do is, is share a lot of information with a lot of the, um, the tech companies. So, for instance, um, we developed a safe and well website post Katrina where somebody could go on um, and you know note that they were safe and well and then their relatives could find them. Now we're finding that it's much better if we you know make sure that there's a button on our app so you can go to your Facebook page right away or you can go to your Twitter page right away because those are reaching way more eyeballs than the American Red Cross safe and well website and we need to take advantage of that. Um, so I, I think it's a, it's a real opportunity for all of us to, to be sharing and to be seeing what are the features. I, I love this um, one that you're talking about, Christina, for college campuses, and what are the features that can tie into that uh, across the platforms. And Christina, what do you see as the most important thank priorities? You, yeah, thank you, Susie. Um, so Next Gen 911 is a, a program initiative in about, I think, two, three years, all 91 centers have to receive um, SMS from, from users. And I think from the government perspective, it's very important that they also give the same consideration to public universities and make sure that that public safety is an important and um, it's a priority basically. They pr provide the right granting programs that those universities know how to integrate their systems and how to give them the flexibility to test other, um, other you know, products out there, other innovations, but making sure that I would say public safety is always a priority from a government perspective as well as Okay, uh, let's uh, move to the audience uh, phase of this. If you have a question, uh, raise your hand. Uh, we have uh, microphones in back. Uh, there's a young lady back there with her hand up with a question. If you can give us your uh, name and your organization, and we ask you to keep your uh, question brief just so we can get to as many people as possible. Oh, yeah, no problem. Uh, my name's Danielle. I'm a student. And okay, that's enough. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Thanks. Um, uh, my question is for any of you, um, with regard to increased reliance on social media for disasters or, um, you know, things that happen on campuses, um, what's the best way, do you all think, to ensure reliability and accuracy of those messages that are coming in from social media? So the reason I ask that, very briefly, is because um, I think it was last year on NC State's campus there was uh, a picture that was sent around Twitter and Facebook of someone who everyone thought was a gunman, but it was a student with an umbrella in their backpack that everybody thought was a gun. And so when people interviewed the police officers later, they blamed social media for using up the valuable police resources on diverting their resources to something you know, where they were shutting down the school for hours for a false alarm. So how do we kind of balance you know, getting as much information to law enforcement as possible while also making sure our resources go to real problems and um, not false alarms. Sure, I'll, I'll take a first stab at that. I would say the first way is, um, that definitely is, is a problem. Um, I think the first way to ensure that is to make sure that the social media tweets and being, things are being sent out are actually going to the right place, meaning to law enforcement. Ideally, you don't want people, you know, sending out information or a tip just on social media because people aren't necessarily listening to that. Have a channel where, you know, if it's a web form or a 911 phone number or whatever it may be, that they actually directly send it to the right people who can then vet that and that not let it kind of propagate. Um, the other thing is only, I would say, you know, a certain percentage, but the more progressive police chiefs out there do have their own social media accounts. And that's something that's taking off more so where now they can also respond and, you know, send out one unified message that says, you know, we're the trusted source. We receive this information. It is or it is not valid. Because I think most students, if they saw the you know the, the local police in that area respond, either you know, not going to favorite it or retweet it, um, it would have shut down that room a lot faster. But by not having law enforcement in that conversation, it allows it to 
to spread. So I think they both have to be on the same link and we have to make sure that it's going directly to them. So we encounter it a lot at Red Cross and, and think about it a lot, but um, because oftentimes if we have um, um, emergency trucks over in one area of the, of the community, do we turn them around because there's one tweet or two tweets saying they need something over here? I mean, where is the, the greater need and how do we screen for that? I mean, obviously we don't, if it's a lone wolf out there, we're not going to turn the truck around. We're going to wait to see if there's, um, you know, um, other uh, tweets that kind of corroborate that there's a problem there and get some critical mass. Also, because we're watching it a lot all the time, we kind of begin to have a feeling we can spot something that's not so true. And as you know, on social media, the crowd will often correct it before you can. So that's good. Um, but we also use social media a lot to try to tamp down rumors. Um, and that's sometimes a problem for us. So, um, you know, for instance, um, we'll see things that we know aren't right, but, you know, we try to respond back. Um, one of the things that happens sometimes is people, they're eager to help, and so they say, you know, give money to the Red Cross. Well, we may not be fundraising for this particular incident. Um, you know, we're fundraising all the time, but there are certain things we don't fundraise for. We don't fundraise during a mass casualty like the Boston Marathon because we're not setting up shelters there. We're not doing the kinds of things that are part of our mission, and, and we would rather that money went to a victim's fund or something like that, so we'll often tweet out, hey, you know, we're not doing that, or, or we don't need blood. That's another one. A lot of people say, give blood. Well, we don't need blood at this time. So we use it to also correct information as much as we do try to watch and, and verify. A, lo a lot of it's training, and, and it's not like 911 calls aren't sometimes erroneous, too. And 911, uh, one of the things that's a problem is we take 911 for granted, uh, but the fact of the matter is that they need, generally need more money for training and, and doing those types of things. Police departments all need to be able to know how to use social media. Uh, this gentleman right here on the aisle has a question. Yes, uh, I am uh, Dr. Nisar Chaudhary. My question is, uh, it would be very different from Umbrella and the gun. Uh, the question is that, uh, is there any research or creative thinking being done? Because there's a decent percentage of people living in this country who do not uh, know or speak English. How do you deal with this kind of situations, even if they call 911, but they don't know English? Well, I ran a 911 center for many years, and um, we have translation services available to those dispatchers. So when those calls come in, we can immediately connect uh, to a service that has hundreds of languages. Um, and it's fairly transparent, and that can also be transferred to the field as well. So those translators can be used both in the field and at the dispatch center. So pretty well-established uh, services to do that. and. Um, I think pretty typical in 911. Right. You know, one of the things that uh, is, uh, I guess you could say it's a strength and a disadvantage for America is we're very dispersed on this side like this. There are literally thousands of 911 centers uh, across the United States. Actually, consolidation of 911 centers would be very helpful because, in essence, you could avail, if you, if you consolidate them, you could avail yourselves of those type of translation services. You could also probably afford more of the um, type of technologies to handle text, uh, next generation 911 and those types of things. So I think that's one of the things. There's no, uh, you know, who's in charge of 911? There's actually nobody in, in D.C. Uh, that's in charge of it and it's left up to the states. There are various agencies that do various things. And so we actually need to have some coordination on that. It's a good question. Mm -hmm. So gentleman right there with his hand up. Thanks. Uh, Andrew Simmons, I'm an urban planner. And I wanted to ask um, about, well, many in the room probably will be familiar with um, this NYU sociologist, um, Eric Klinenberg, who wrote a piece in The New Yorker in January on climate-proofing cities and the, the important, emphasizing the importance of social capital and when um, technology fails, actually, and how people rely to traditional, um, those with, say, social capital connections. Um, they rely on on that and otherwise people are, are left out and that's what happened um, to a large degree with let's say the victims, um, the casualties that occurred with Hurricane Sandy. Um, so I'm, yeah, I'm wondering what your thoughts on that topic would be. Thanks. 
So it's an over-reliance, uh, perhaps an over-reliance of technology yeah. and depending on that. Uh, yeah. Oh, go ahead. Sorry. Go ahead, Jen. No, no go ahead. Well, I, know I was actually going to say it to your question because not everybody's on social media. Um, and we find that quite a bit in disasters. In fact, um, you know, a lot of the people on social media tend to be better off. They tend to be younger, urban. They're more able to take care of themselves. But what about the vulnerable people who maybe don't have a, the lang language or who are older? population. So I think you have to look at it in, as layers of communications. You know, you, you just can't all rely on social media by any means. We don't see it as a panacea at all. Um, we still, during Sandy, had to go through neighborhoods in our emergency response vehicles with bullhorns, you know, telling people we were there. And, and we really knew we were finally getting to everybody when they were sick of our bullhorn. But I mean, you can't, uh, you have to layer it on top of other technologies. And um, you know, we always tell people, it, particularly in emergency, you know, call 911. We we hate to pe people think that social media is the 911, but a lot of them do now. But uh, I think you have to just consider it as one of many communication tools, and and use them all. And, and, and I think you're, you're exactly right. We we are there's a there's a possibility of disenfranchising people who need that type of help by totally relying on technology, and that's why it does need to be additive. For instance, I mean, oldest, oldest technology for alerting, uh, you know, were bells, and that's kind of been replaced by sirens. We still need to have that type of technology. The uh, FEMA has, is the, the lead on the integrated public uh, alert and warning system, IPAWS, which actually integrates that. You can send out these alerts over various platforms. So you can alert the sign. You actually have the signs on the highways going off at the same time your cell phone is alerting out. out. So, there needs to be that. That's why I think there need to be uh, programs that actually puts technology in people's hands uh, for that, that very reason for emergency alerting. And the other, the other community that it can be disenfranchised by types of uh, um, uh, technology, uh, and we need to think about this too, are, are any disability communities, uh, uh, hearing impaired, sight impaired, people like that, and we need to think about those. And that's actually one place where technology can help us, uh, but we need to make sure that that's actually included in the calculus when those things are being deployed. Uh, right there on the aisle, this gentleman. Hi, thank you. My name is Ben Montgomery. I'm with a uh, telecom company, Lemcon, L-E-M-C-O-N. And I have a first net question. Uh, th thank you for your comments on that. The, the question is, when you look out at the network infrastructure building that's set to take place, how much of that do you think will be brand new call it cell site, tower work, you know, brand new dedicated infrastructure, and how soon might that be happening? What, what do you see? And the second question related to FirstNet is, uh, the carriers, the OEMs like Ericsson, Motorola, everyone seems to have a point of view on that program. And the program does seem to be moving along. Uh, and there are also questions about D-block spectrum allocation, what have you. So the question there would be, uh, how quickly do you think things are going to move along in the next months, couple of years? Is, is it guaranteed to happen? Because a lot of groups are eyeballing uh, that, that money, and a lot of groups, such as your peers, are relying on an up and running system here pretty soon. So right. cell towers, and what do you predict? Thank you. Sure. So the first thing I'll do is uh, you've given me an, uh, a, uh, an opportunity to advertise a free publication that I wrote last uh, <laughs> September called What Should FirstNet Do First, which actually addresses some of your questions and it seems to be tracking on the timelines uh, so far. So because of the amount of money that's uh, involved to create a, a nationwide public safety broadband network, uh, I mean $2 billion to $7 billion sounds like a huge amount of money, but for a nationwide network it's, it's nowhere close enough. So what's going to have to happen is you have to leverage the commercial networks to some degree. And for that reason, I think that the, the new sites that you're going to see, the new towers, are pro primarily going to be in areas where it's not currently commercially viable to provide that service. How many sites will that be? It's going to be, I would say, tens of thousands, uh, but, but I, can't, I can't tell you exactly because, quite frankly, FirstNet has not actually uh, announce exactly what their architecture is going to be. Some of the most important work that's going on at FirstNet right now is creating the, the business model, the cost model, to be able to tell uh, America how this is actually going to work. Um, so that, that would be the, the first answer. To it. As far as time frame, in, in, in my study uh, from 2012, I basically said it may take, because of the way the statute is set up, it may take four years to actually launch. Now that may be, there may be some areas that go faster, and the reason for that is is that there, um, 
while I was at FCC and NTIA came up with the, uh, the BTOP program to try and get there to be some early deployers from which we can learn about uh, FirstNet and how this is going to work, but also to get something going. Uh, and so I, I really hope that FirstNet continues down the road that it seems to be going down and having early deployments. Uh, you can look to Mississippi, Texas, uh, maybe the Bay Area. Some of these are the ones of the early deployers uh, to actually get out there. Um, Part, part of it is making sure, and I'll, I'll, I'll throw a, a note to Qualcomm since they're one of our sponsors, is, you know, making sure that the, the chipsets for the, for the devices that cover band class 14, which is actually the public safety broadband um, uh, network uh, spectrum that's going to be able to, to be used. Uh, but overall, this could take some, some amount of time. And one of the things I would say, it will happen. That money will be spent, the first $2 billion. The second $5 billion is actually dependent on uh, incentive auctions uh, at the FCC. That, that may take some time. There's, um, it seems to be on track, but uh, no one has ever done it exactly that way before, and so we don't know exactly how, how it will happen. Will that yield the $5 billion, and then when will um, FirstNet get it to spend it? So I think the first $2 billion will be spent. The, the question really is, will we be successful in launching a truly nationwide network, and will it be interoperable? And, and I, I would add the caveat to that is, if it's not nationwide, well, then it's not really truly interoperable because not everybody's going to be able to talk to one another. Uh, right there is a young lady with a question. Hi, my name is Stacy Elmer. I'm from uh, HHS, the Office of Preparedness and Response. I am also an EMT. So my, my question for you is, with, even with the implementation of this communications infrastructure, and I think actually on a federal level we're doing a decent job of staying networked with new technologies and the use of social media across the federal interagency, but when I get on my ambulance in Maryland, we, don't, we have first generation GPS systems. In New Orleans, they don't have GPS still in their ambulances. So I guess the question for me is trying to think through how we remedy sort of the end user of this product. There's a communications issue on a large scale, but then there's also a communications issue on a very local level. And um, EMS in particular and fire departments vary across the country and certainly vary across states. And I wonder if you have any good ideas for how we can leverage private industries who are developing these new technologies to actually, fund. it's all about funding. How do we fund the implementation of, for instance, um, r radios within ambulances that can accept new kinds of communication, and uh, should there be standards, and if so, who who develops those standards, and then how do we get those things funded on the ground so that we're not doing this on a federal level without thinking through the end user? Well, I mean, there are some standards. I mean, that's what uh, organizations like APCO um, are, are formed for. I think we're seeing lots of grant programs uh, that are funding P25 radios and, and other technologies uh, that are required. Um, we're also seeing the costs involved dropping. When you look at mobile data computers today, they're usually they're laptops, they have external modems, they have mounts, they have it's pretty expensive to put uh, mobile technology into ambulance and, and fire trucks. Uh, but now with tablets and uh, smartphones, the cost to deploy uh, the, you know, the mobile side of things I think is coming down considerably. I think it's going to be, you know, a tenth of what the costs are today in the future. I mean, you're seeing applications that are very powerful that are very inexpensive and uh, even have, uh, they go beyond the capabilities that we're seeing today on traditional systems. By the way, I think that some of the funding that would be coming down, which I, I hope will, will continue to come down on a year-to-year -year basis, will be to make sure that uh, ambulances, fire trucks, police cars are actually uh, equipped to take the network with you. So in essence, they can extend the network and be, be a way of repeating and creating a, uh, in essence, a hot spot for uh, public safety officials in, in that particular area. So I wish the FCC did have funding. No, that, that'll primarily come through DHS and through, uh, I think FEMA has some of those types of grants and then NTIA. Yeah, you, you all see Department of Commerce. Assistance to firefighter grants. 
Uh, okay, uh, so I'd like to welcome Anita Stewart uh, with us. Uh, Anita, as I mentioned earlier, is Senior Vice President of Strategic Partnerships at the Sesame uh, Workshop. Uh, I know you had a uh, flight delay, so I'm glad you're uh, Three hours able on to the runway. <laughs> <laughs> That's always fun. I've had that experience, Were too. Were you able to use your mobile device? Mm -hmm. <laughs> I did. <laughs> So I'd like to uh, take a moment. I know Sesame has done some very uh, innovative programming, particularly uh, around efforts to educate uh, young kids about public safety. So could you talk a little bit about your activities in this area? Sure. Um, we know, uh, especially after, after Katrina, we know that many children were, were lost. Um, they didn't know um, their names. They didn't know where to go. They didn't have a plan. Um, and so we embarked, actually we worked with her, um, Homeland Security, and we uh, embarked on a plan, a get ready uh, program, and really using the Muppets to communicate to young children and families um, about what you need to do in the case of an emergency, whether it's a natural disaster or anything you know that might happen. And um, we now um, launch that program on cell phones with the help of Qualcomm in China, especially in many of the areas where there are major earthquakes. Um, and for the first time, this information is on cell phones. And so um, we feel that it really, really works for several reasons. And we actually did some research with 31 families before we launched it. But um, having that kind of information in a very simple way for children and their families to really access um, really works from several perspectives. One. Uh, the mobile device itself, you can, you can plan and do things anywhere when, when you have this program. And um, later on, I'll give you the, the website where you can get on the China uh, one. The other is it's very interactive. So families are doing it, especially moms and, and dads are doing it with their children. So they're building their, their kits. Uh, they're putting the plan together on where they're going to meet. Um, they learn about the community, where should they meet, et cetera. And the third thing is really our content because it is very child friendly and sesame friendly and children love that Elmo and the other Muppets are telling them what to do and everything's very positive role modeling. Um, in the research that we did um, in the States, which was not on, was, was, is online but was not on cell phones, uh, we really found that families were doing um, more of their kits, uh, putting together plans, um, and it wasn't only the children, it was very interactive. Um, in China, when we did the research in 31 families, um, the rest of the, the families and neighborhoods and all of that were saying, well, why aren't we involved in this? But when we launched it, we're able, in China, we're probably able to reach well over um, a million families. So in the very areas that read, need that uh, information. So that's kind of... And the other thing is just on the other side of it is also after there's a disaster, we have so much content that make children feel normalized. I mean, in Haiti, when the schools were down, when people are in tents, all of that, we have materials that we can have on cell phones and the parents or whoever are some of the, the, the rescue workers or the emergency workers can help by having that content and making a child feel a little calmer so. Great. Uh, let's take a couple more uh, questions. Uh, over here, there's a young lady with a question. There's a microphone that's coming over to you. Hi, I'm Bridget Golub. I'm also a student working at FEMA this summer. And I've been looking into... Blue t-shirt. Yeah, you didn't get a t-shirt. You didn't get a t-shirt. <laughs> show you my badge if you want. Okay. <laughs> okay. Um, I've been looking at public affairs offices and public information officers, and I've noticed that a lot of them are adapting, starting to use social media. But I'm curious if you think that emergency response organizations or um, emergency management offices need to be kind of training the rest of their employees to use social media. If they're on the ground, they're the ones who can get the information out fastest. I was just going to speak to that with the previous question Stacy asked, but um, we did some polling on this and found that the public has very high expectations that emergency response organizations are listening to them on, on social media. In fact, the poll that, that really <laughs> startled us was that uh, they felt, 76% felt that if they posted something on social media, that they should get a response within three hours from some 
uh, you know, emergency management organization. And we know there's a gap there because, like all of us, we're all trying to get up to speed on this new technology and how to respond to it and how to answer it faster. So I think one of the needs that's going to be great is for training. I mean, we see it in our own workforce, and a lot of our workforce are volunteers. A lot of them are maybe, you know, older generation. They're not used to these technologies. So we have to do a lot of training. It's going to take uh, culture changes um, a bit to understand that this information is, is just as important as the information they're used to getting through other means. So I think it is a big issue, but I do see, as we see, more and more um, local and state emergency management offices really beginning to embrace it and really um, you know, getting their people to embrace it. I just think it's going to take time and training. And I think there's some challenges. You normally centralize your public information, and social media by its very nature is very decentralized. So organizations try to figure out, you know, how can we react fast? How can we... Um, you know, we'd be participating in the conversation when we're trying to, to somewhat control that, that message that goes out and make sure that it's, it's accurate. And um, so it's a challenge for not just government organizations, but, you know, corporations, everybody trying to have a staff that uh, really can respond to the types of questions and the diverse questions that are coming and do it in a timely fashion. Um, and and just challenge. one other thing I was going to add is, is it shouldn't just reside in the public affairs function of an organization. Right. We, we try to say that we want to push it out and make it part of our whole operational DNA. So at the Red Cross, for instance, we want people in our blood operations to know how to use social media. They're the subject matter experts. They're the ones that can respond. And so one of the things that I was describing in our digital operations center is a console where we can sort by topic. And if somebody has a question about their blood or their blood type or something, we can relay that to someone over in the blood operations, not in the public affairs shop, but an expert who can then respond. And it sounds like this is consistent with the Sesame approach where you're wanting to kind of diffuse the information out among parents uh, and families as well. Bridget and said the community, I'm sorry, as in the community as well, so that they know you know, especially for young children, you know, they don't know how to react sometimes. And there were a lot of, uh, I believe, after Katrina, a lot of new uh, policies put into place, especially for, for young children. Jamie? Yeah, Bridget, so, you know, the public affairs uh, function, a lot of times people think of as pushing information out. What you're referring to is actually bringing information in. It's a paradigm shift in some ways. Uh, but the, the main thing is, as if you heard up here, is, and you can tell whether there's going to be progress on this, on how much it's being incorporated into training and into exercises. But look what's happened over the last four or five years. When we've been going through at the state, federal, and local levels, the, the budget problems we've had, what gets cut? Training is real easy to cut. Exercises are real easy to cut. So we may actually not be doing as much as we should and I suspect that a lot of the efforts out there, people are just taking out a hide or great, you know, uh, leaders are just trying to make it happen anyway. But it's really one in, in 911 and in disaster response and uh, in the exercises. All this is very important that we start restoring the training budgets just so we can do that and be able to treat uh, uh, social media as an integral part of response. Okay, in the very back, there's a gentleman with this question. Hi, my name is Jim. I'm a local entrepreneur. Uh, I recently took a trip around Asia where I got to meet with some police headquarters, fire departments, and telecommunication bureaus, and I was really impressed with the innovations I saw being implemented abroad and the dynamics of um, the situations other countries have to address. I was wondering, what are some things you've seen other countries implementing and addressing that we need to start looking at here in the USA? Anita, do you want to talk about other countries? You've been in China. <laughs> well, China, I think, you know, they have... Um, one of the things that they've really looked at is, as far as the response is concerned, I think is really a coordination um, that is outstanding. And I, I've seen some places that have been impacted by earthquakes and, you know, in the next, I don't know, month, uh, you wouldn't know that, the, that anything had happened there. So um, that's one thing. I think the other thing is that they um, have really looked at um, some of the bigger issues, infrastructure issues. I know I was in one area where the schools, they, they rethought about how they started building again. Um, so they, um, instead of having small rural schools, they developed one school for an area, and they really, I, mean, I think the Japanese government actually helped them build
build a safer school so that it was better from an earthquake point of view. Um, I think the other thing is um, that they're, they're looking at the preparedness part. I think, you know, I've been seeing some PSAs on, um, in New York, that's where I come from, um, and it's, it's on preparedness, but I don't think we're doing as much in that area as many countries are. Yeah, I, I don't know that I could speak to, to everything, but I, I, th this may not be real exciting, but uh, when I was at FCC, the, the Great East uh, Japan earthquake occurred, and we, we studied, and we actually worked with the, the Japanese embassy here uh, to learn as much as we can could about it. I mean, one of the things that uh, the Japanese have always known, because it's a, uh, obviously an earthquake active uh, uh, area, is, is hardening their networks. And so they had significant damage to their communication networks afterwards, obviously, but the, the fact that they do harden it was, was very important. And so that's something that, that we should learn uh, about here as, as we move forward, because we have commercial networks. They're commercial grade, they're very reliable, but they don't necessarily withstand. So when we build FirstNet, it should, be, it should des definitely be hardened. Uh, we also need to look at, at how long it can sustain, and this is one thing the FCC is, has looked at uh, over the past few years. Uh, you don't necessarily need three days of battery backup because, quite frankly, it would be too expensive for us to be able to afford cell phones. But it is something we need to start working on as a, as a country, is making sure that these things can stay up as long as possible, that we're using the latest uh, battery technologies that we're uh, interspersing. We mentioned Haiti several times up here. After the, I mean, that's devastating, decapitating earthquake in, in Haiti um, in, uh, in 2010, right? Um, and, but the amazing thing is about 80% of, uh, well, at least two of the cell phone networks stayed up. And they stayed up because Haiti, just because of the way they've structured it, had a lot of uh, generators uh, associated with their cell towers. And the reason that is is their electrical grid's not very good. And so actually one of the major problems in Haiti after the earthquake was people stealing the fuel uh, for the, the generators to keep the cell towers going. You saw those start blinking off the line after a while uh, because they couldn't keep somebody guarding all those at the same time. But I mean, that, that actually was a major advantage to the response in Haiti is just having those cell phones uh, staying up to the degree they did. We don't have that. We actually don't have that here. Yeah, no, James is right, and I'm glad you remind us about that, because one of the most effective ways we found to get cholera messages out to the people in Haiti when they had the cholera epidemic, you know, short bursts of, of um, preparedness tips that you could take, um, was through cell phones, because so much of the country was on them. Um, we even worked for quite some time, although the Haitian government never approved it, to use cell phones as a way to actually put cash in people's hands. Um, so, um, because uh, a lot of people in Haiti are used to going to banks with cell phones and things like that, and we worked on a program of cash transfer, but uh, ultimately the government um, didn't want us to go through with that, and you have to respect each country and how they want to do it. But I see that as another way that cell phones and, and mobile technology are in disaster response in giving financial assistance to people could very well go through the through your mobile. So Christina, if I could uh, build on that question, I'm just curious, have you gotten inquiries from campuses in other countries about either your activities here, or have you looked at what's going on in other countries in terms of how they're trying to safen their campuses? Definitely. Um, I mean, unfortunately, campus shootings are not you know unique to um, international countries, but they're very common to the United States. There's big, big ones in other countries, but they have a kind of a culture of shifting away from it a little bit and moving you know, past. Um, we have had inquiries from Canadian universities. Um, that's been, I think, the biggest one because they've had a couple of really big massacres happen and because they're also very you know, um, adoptive of mobile technologies that they're the ones that we've been working with. Um, also, a couple of campus law enforcement associations naturally work with Canadian ones as well. Um, but in terms of the United States, I think even in the states, they're not equal in terms of what they, how proactive they are in their preparedness. So I think looking at you know, Virginia, Texas, Colorado, there's still some that are more proactive in the kind of training that they do, proactive shooter response, and the kinds of um, education to get their students that it still has to kind of catch on here as well before it can go abroad. But I think the yeah. U.S. Can is Can I mention that. one other thing to that question? So there's another thing, and this is not just to kiss up to Qualcomm because they're uh, sp help sponsoring this, but they've got a chip that's a satellite chip, and, and actually you can stick these in phones so that you can, if, if, if the entire cellular network fails, you can, you can still be able to communicate by satellite, and it can fail over to that. If it, so that's one of the things, I think, and it's much cheaper than trying to put up the hardened towers 
uh, wind-resistant towers, earthquake-proof uh, uh, towers, and put uh, battery backup or, or diesel generators, some type of generators on there as well. So that's another innovation I think we need to look at for the reliability and resiliency, and it's also important for public safety as well. Other questions? Uh, right back there. Thanks. I'm Beth Ferris, also at Brookings. Um, I find this all very fascinating. I wonder if any of you could talk about the impact of this technology on the ways we work. You mentioned, for example, you know, kind of a loss of control of centralized information sharing when you might have five or 50 staff tweeting about what's happening or what should be done. Or, or the Red Cross, what happens if one of these volunteers gives bad information? Are you responsible? Uh, to what extent is it changing the way in which we work? It, I mean, it definitely is. It's requiring um, you know, new policies, new ways to think about um, how you interact with the community. I think as we look at the, the Pulse Point application, it's, uh, it's a type of relationship that never existed before, where you're really counting on your community to be your first first responders, and you're actually dispatching your citizens. Um, and that's a very different way to, to look at your community. You know, it's not fire, EMS, here to provide you services, but here's a whole new partnership. And what other technologies, how could that be extended? I think you're gonna see a whole new class of applications where you have people that have skills that they're willing to, to share, and we know where they're at. And if you think about just one example, there may be an off-duty police officer being notified of crimes in progress would be similar to a pulse point type app, but in a police application. Or uh, during a major <coughs> storm, you have a building that has maybe somebody with a medical emergency, but also is full of healthcare professionals but that also live in that building. So I think that um, over the next few years, you are gonna see um, a whole new class of location-based service applications that uh, are just being conceived right now. That's, I know, a little bit different than your question, but you know, the, the world's changing because of social media in many, many ways. I, I think we've certainly, you know, that was the, the big um, hurdle we had to get over with our legal department, <laughs> you know, uh, you know, everybody out tweeting, could they say things that were wrong? And honestly, it has not been a problem. We may have had some isolated incidents, um, and, and what we've tried to do is correct that information on social media. Um, but, you know, by and large, we assume that most people sending out something are sending it accurately, and when there's an instance that it doesn't, we, we try to isolate that, correct it. Even a little humor sometimes can help. We had one of our very best uh, social media people. She had her own private account and she had her Red Cross account. Uh -oh. And by mistake, she tweeted out on the Red Cross account that she and her husband liked to buy dogfish ale. <laughs> <And> <laughs> all of a sudden, you know, it was all erupting and everything. But you know, we just kind of tweeted out, "Look, you know, we've taken away the car keys. Everybody's over <laughs> here at the Red Cross. Don't worry." And it had the added effect of the, you know, the crowd loved it. And pretty soon, Dogfish Ale jumped in and said, you know, we'll give, you know, a dollar to Red Cross if you, want, if you retweet this. So, you know, you can sponsor her wedding. wedding. Yeah. Yeah. Emergency <laughs> supplies of Dogfish Ale. Yeah. Anita, have you encountered any special legal issues given the fact you work with young kids? Um, we really target the parents. I mean, but we, we you know, we have to, everything that we do, um, we, we use social media a lot as well. Uh, you know, like Elmo has a tweet and so does Big Bird and all that. But, um, you know, we, we're really careful about what we say and how we say it. We really haven't had any, any major issues coming up. I mean, when I first gave the, uh, the concept of, hey, let's dispatch our citizens to major medical emergencies, you know, it did raise issues uh, that had to be explored. And, you know, so you are getting into, you know, areas that just haven't been explored. Things are possible today that weren't possible before. And, and you just have to, to work through them. Okay, I think we have time for one more question right here. Hi, my name is uh, Jackie Kazel. Uh, I'm Presidential Innovation Fellow working with FEMA. Uh, and my question is about the Campus app. Um, so I actually have two, so I'm gonna try to sneak in two and whatever I can get, I'll get. Um, have you thought of scaling that up 
for um, and creating a city app. Um, Definitely. Okay. That's, that's the larger vision. We're just starting with universities, but eventually it's anyone could have the app on their phone and use it. Okay. And then my second question is uh, for Red Cross, uh, what kind of data sharing are you doing for the data that you're collecting uh, for other emergency response officials and agencies? Well, we're just exploring that. Um, and, you know, we, during a disaster, we're constantly talking with our colleagues at FEMA. We have a daily call down about the emergency social data we're seeing, and we're checking it with what they're seeing, trying to, to see trends and things like that. We've had um, some um, uh, opportunities now with emergency management offices, like in Oklahoma and other places, to be in the um, state emergency management operations and sharing our social data there uh, with and, and whatever's coming in mostly locally. Um, so we're beginning to work it, but we haven't, you know, we're still new at this and um, we uh, totally agree with the principle of sharing that that's how we'll do it, but we're still working through the processes. Okay, uh, I want to thank our panel. All of you were uh, terrific. Uh, so I want to thank uh, Christina, Susie, Anita, uh, Jamie, and uh, Richard. And thank you very much for uh, coming out.